Welcome. <laughs> I think we're all here. The only thing that's not here is we haven't been able to get it to YouTube because we are really missing our Sam, who is home from the library, not working this week. And she's usually our stopgap if something's not quite what we need to do. And unfortunately, that's the case for YouTube. But Vicki is recording it, so this will go on YouTube later, not just right away. And as we get started, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and just kind of do our regular intro that we do every time when we have um, a meeting. And that is just to remind everybody that this is Chat and Chew and our focus is on a low fat, low salt, low sugar, plant strong diet, because that is our goal is to change our health outcomes with our own efforts. Um, and we are a group of people that are volunteer, we're not a business. And we partner with businesses as they have things that will meet our goals and we help each other as we do that. As we move into this, these changes with our lifestyle choices and our diet, we listen to our mentors and one of them is Dr. John McDougall. And he reminds us that if we are sick or if we are on medication or if we're pregnant, we wanna be sure and include our health prep uh, health provider in what we're doing so that they can maybe we might have to decrease our medications for example and that would be wonderful which has happened to a lot of our members um, and also he reminds us because diet is so powerful we we really do need to do that um, we want to take a b12 supplement and you would be doing that anyway if you're over 50 says the national institute of health but as you move more plants on your plate and crowd out some of the meat then that's a good thing to get. Okay, we are gonna videotape this one, so it will go to YouTube eventually. And let's look and see what's on our plate for today's meeting. Well, our Zoom plant-based plate is first we're gonna talk about Code Blue. And I know that you, the feedback I've been getting is how excited you've been about that opportunity to watch Code Blue. So we're gonna to get to talk to somebody who made that possible. Then at 12 o'clock noon, we are going to be Zooming with Dr. Stanza, and that will be the time we're going to go fast and furious with your questions and answers because she's got a limited time with us, and we're so appreciative of that. And then we'll finish with some information about one of our future speakers for November, our Zoom to Finland with Dr. Puska. In fact, he's going to join us today. He sent me a text this morning from Finland to say that he was going to drop in, so we're excited that we'll be able to see him as well. So let's get going with the actual Zoom. And, um, you know, everything always works perfectly until it doesn't. And so Debbie and Linda, can you wave to show us your face somewhere? I don't even know if they're on anymore, but they have been. Yeah. Debbie? I'm on. I'm on. Okay. She, she has no electricity. And so it's... Oh, no. <laughs> And she's been frantically trying to figure out what to do. She called me this morning from her car, driving around with her phone charging so she could talk. And <laughs> so they found a, a phone that will work. So, but she can't, her signal is not the best. So for that reason, I'm gonna go ahead and take on her responsibilities. And that was to introduce our special guest, Dillip Barman. And Dillip, are you here somewhere? Yeah, can you, can you hear me, see me? I can't, oh, there you are, yes. Vicki, can you put him in spotlight so I can tell a little bit about him? Okay, I need to know his, his okay, I see him. Okay. Very good. <laughs> I can see his hand. There we go. Welcome, Dylan. Thanks. Hey, so we are so excited you're here. I mean, you're one of those special people like Debbie that's a Food for Life instructor. And that's a very select international group I discovered that was trained by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And you're also president of an organization called Triangle Vegetarian Society, which funds, hosts the largest vegan Thanksgiving. <laughs> wow. I know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're on numerous boards. And oh my gosh, I know about your cooking demonstrations because Debbie invited me on one of your international tours where you had food for life instructors, even from Italy. So you put together some real things. He's an educator, so there's so many of us that are educators. You're close to our heart, Dylan. Um, but you're doing stuff in schools to promote good nutrition. Thank you. Um, he writes, he cooks, he speaks, he understands the world and media. 
So it's no surprise, he's the executive producer of Code Blue. So welcome, Dylan. We have time for you to share a couple of things that mean so much to you about this, bit, this documentary. Well, thanks so much, Kathy, and thanks everybody for, for watching today. I think you're in for a treat. Uh, it's been my privilege to get to work with uh, Dr. Stancic. I've been working with her for about two or three years now. And uh, can everybody hear me okay? Am I loud enough? Mm -hmm. So um, we, we um, she, it's really her idea, and I came along about a year into it. Um, I won't steal her thunder, and you probably already know a little bit about her, but she was diagnosed with MS, and she's a doctor, and even doctors get sick. <laughs> and so she saw her own doctor who put her on a very difficult regimen, which um, made it, uh, she had trouble sleeping, she had lots of side effects. And so she did her own research and said that uh, there was evidence that a plant-based diet could help with MS. So she shared it with her doctor, and the doctor said, no, 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 stick with these medications. Um, and she did, but it wasn't, it, it didn't go well. So then she said, no, look, I, I, I'm, I'm a big girl. I know what I'm doing. I'm a doctor. And so she, she went, uh, you know, and I'm not suggesting we self-diagnose, right? But she did. She's a doctor. And she went on the plant-based diet. And a year later, her symptoms were gone. She's symptom-free. And so it turns out there are many other people who've also been down this path. And so what we've tried to do with this film is share, it's not, uh, I don't know if there's any doctors in the house. Uh, it's not the doctor's fault. Doctors in medical school typically get just a few hours of nutrition education in their six to 10 years of uh, you know, education to become a doctor. It's just not part of the curriculum. Uh, and so doctors don't tend to know much about nutrition. And so what we're suggesting with this film is that there needs to be a much larger role of nutrition in medical education. Uh, we as consumers need to educate ourselves and tell our doctors, hey, here's something I'd like to be able to do and point to evidence. You probably are familiar with Michael Greger, for example, PCRM, uh, Neil Barnard, Brenda Davis. There's so many good folks. Take credible evidence with you and say, hey, doc, I'd like to you know, pursue a plant-based diet. I think this will help. And here's some information to share. And if you're a medical provider, we encourage you to you know, get good nutrition education. There's lots of great conferences American College of Lifestyle Medicine, our conference was in your state, Florida, last year. Uh, PCRM has a wonderful conference every year, PPOD, Plant-Based plant Prevention of Disease. There's many, many conferences, and that's what we're hoping to do with the film. Uh, medical providers learn more about nutrition. Uh, consumers uh, demand more from your medical providers from a nutrition point of view. And, uh, and Kathy, I, I will leave it at that. I know time is very limited, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions maybe a little later or if you have anything right now. Uh, I, I think you'll enjoy the film um, and, uh, and, and please share it with, with your friends. It's available at codebluedoc.com. Folks can go there and they can uh, uh, rent it basically or, or buy the DVD. Oh, that's what I was gonna ask you. You know, now that I've seen it, I was thinking, boy, my doctor would really benefit from a copy of this, whether he knows it or not. And um, <laughs> I was wondering, is it, can I buy a DVD? Because I think that's the better way to work with him. Okay, so that's on, on codeblue.com. Yeah, yeah. What did you think of the film, Kathy? Oh, wow. In fact, we ought to ask Vicki. Vicki had the best quote of all. Vicki, tell me I, what you thought. I loved it. It's the best of all of them, as far as I'm concerned. I, I didn't think they'd be able to top t Game Changers. Mm -hmm. But just everything in that film and the walk with the doc, and just so many good lines in there. I just, I'm going to have to watch it again. I, and I was the one who was asking Kathy about DVDs, because I've got a couple of people I'd like to get a DVD to. So, and, yeah, it's great. You know what? You know what's heartbreaking, Vicki, what, what you just said is there's so many good clips and there are, but, but behind the scenes, there were so many great things we couldn't include. I'm sure. We had to bound it. We had an earlier version, which was about 10 minutes longer, and we had to cut some of that. And we had lots of B-roll, so there's more we would love to share. But well, you need to come out with a, uh, what do they I, call it, the cuts. The, I agree. Yeah, come out with another one. About that. With all that. Good. <laughs> well, I'll be the first in line for that one. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, I was just checking to see, does anybody see you on the um, a participants list? Because she was coming in at 12, and I was looking to see if she was there. I, I don't oh. see her. Okay, well, y'all keep an eye out for her. But in the meantime, Dilip, I want you to listen to one of our members, and she happens to be the one who actually encouraged us almost a year and a half to two years ago. 
and that's Linda Phillips. So Linda, let's take Dilip out of the spotlight. There's Linda, good. So Linda, what is it that after just, I mean, it must have been close to two years, wasn't it? And you said to me, we need to show this at Chat and Chew, Code Blue. And we didn't think it was possible with COVID-19 with our Skype, but you asked for it, didn't you? I did, I did. Um, my husband and our, our journey started about three years ago, so we weren't very far into it. And um, we were thirsty sponges for why didn't we know this? We felt guilty that we didn't. And when I saw the trailer for it, um, it, it just intrigued us. And my husband was saying, look, it's not our fault. Many of the doctors don't know. And here's one who does. And we thought it would give us um, you know, ammunition or maybe a way to, to deal with our doctors so that maybe this became um, more um, evident to the doctors. And it, we just thought it would give us more scientific information for rationale for why we do this lifestyle. And we just um, couldn't wait to see it. Well, Sar Sarai has joined us. I, I, I applaud your comments, Linda. That's absolutely true. And again, we need to realize it's really not our fault. And it's also not the doctor's fault. And I think it's vectors like this. It's this information, this films like this, books like uh, your group, I think is probably quite familiar with uh, websites, forks over knives, things of that nature that we could use to empower ourselves to in turn empower our healthcare providers to give us the best care they can. And, and Sarai has joined us, by the way. Oh, thank you, Mandela. I appreciate that. Let me have my husband, Robert, introduce you. Robert, can, Vicki, can you put uh, the spotlight on Robert? Because I want him to tell a little bit about Dr. Stanzik before we actually listen to him. Can you do that for me, Vicki? I can. I need to find him in the list here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have so many today. We've got, I know. I'm not used to having so many to scroll through. Yeah. Uh, so, but we have a real treat. We get to look at Dr. Stanzik. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a, it's a great honor and privilege to be with all of you today. Oh, and I heard my beautiful friend Dillip's voice, but I don't see him. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing Robert, so. Well, I'm here. <laughs> I know you are, but I'm not finding you in the list. I'm looking at been... me. Well, Vicki, why don't you just cancel the spotlight? In fact, we could probably do that. Okay. And then, Robert, you start talking and introduce Dr. Sansa. Well, the introduction probably has already just been done, but I'll, I'll give a little bit more. Uh, 60 years ago, my mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Uh, about uh, a, a good way into the uh, uh, disease, she saw Dr. Roy Swank. Dr. Swank told her to make some lifestyle changes to eat less saturated fat. Uh, she did that, but it was too far advanced, and uh, unfortunately, she died at age 44 from uh, multiple sclerosis Sorry about, uh, about, that. about 50 years ago. Uh, the doctor you're going to hear today, Dr. Sarai Stansik, has multiple sclerosis, and she has made lifestyle changes, as you have heard, that has helped her deal with her disease not only deal with it, but probably, I guess you could, you could say overcome it. She uh, is a doctor uh, and she has board certification in three different fields, internal medicine, infectious diseases, and lifestyle. Uh, by the way, I've, I've, I have a lot of run-ins with doctors since I'm a personal injury attorney and I'm with doctors all the time. And I've always believed that the smartest doctors out there are in uh, doctors that are board certified in, in internal medicine, and she has that. So I know from the get-go that she's smart. In 2012, she uh, decided that uh, it was time that uh, lifestyle medicine should be the big part of her life, and she turned to that, and she turned to uh, train other doctors so that uh, the word might get out and get out globally. She has produced... Uh, co-created, uh, starred in Code Blue. It's a fabulous movie. Uh, I guess I, in watching the movie, I probably cried thinking about my mom and how she was not able to overcome her uh, disability, but Dr. Stansick has found the way. Just recently, she, recently she published her first book. Uh, it came out, I, I believe, October 20th. What's Missing from Medicine? Six Lifestyle Changes to Overcome Chronic Illness. What's Missing from Medicine? You might want to go out and get it. She is a remarkable lady, and uh, we're very fortunate at Chat and Chew to be able to uh, hear her today. Okay. 
Robert, thank you so much for that introduction. I am uh, very moved by your sharing your personal story about your mother. I'm so sorry to hear it. Uh, in large part, this is what fuels uh, my work is getting the word out so that we can uh, bring this all important message to so many who are not regrettably receiving it by their physicians today. Um, you mentioned Roy Swank and Roy Swank was one of the first publications that I came across in 2003, when I first became aware that diet and lifestyle could play a role in not only better managing disease, but potentially reversing it. And it was an article that he published in 1952, believe it or not, in the New England Journal of Medicine that spoke to his hypothesis that saturated fat was playing a role in the pathogenesis of the disease. So uh, Dr. Swank is very important to me uh, and his work uh, certainly made a big difference in and sort of put me on this path. So thank you so much for sharing that. I want to thank uh, Kathy and Chat and Chu for inviting me to be uh, with you today. And, and of course, Dilip Barman, who is our executive producer, I know is, is on the call, has made it possible for, uh, for so many to gain access to the film. And uh, just to, I guess, summarize for those who aren't familiar uh, with my entire story, um, I was, I'm an infectious disease physician internist. Um, back in 1995, about 25 years ago now, I was acutely diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in the midst of a, a very busy call in the hospital. I awakened to find that I couldn't find, I couldn't feel my legs rather. And that put me on the chronic disease path. And it led to um, a very difficult period in my life. Between 1995 and 2003, I, I largely progressed uh, to the point that I was dependent on a cane. Uh, I was taking about 12 medicines at this point and largely feeling hopeless. And then by chance, I came across literature, as, as Robert uh, pointed to, namely the literature that Roy Swank uh, had published that led to uh, interest and, and a pursuit to further understand how lifestyle affects health outcomes. And I think what is most regrettable and as you know, my story goes on to, uh, as I implemented these lifestyle changes, I went from someone who was dependent uh, on a cane and 12 medicines to somebody who crossed the finish line at a marathon and takes no medicine. And just two weeks ago, I celebrated 25 years, uh, or rather commemorated 25 years since I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis with a 25 mile run walk with family and friends. Uh, and it was, in, it was quite a celebration. But what is most regrettable to me is that uh, the one intervention, the one bit of advice that I needed to receive as a patient living with MS, I didn't receive from my doctors who were experts in the field. I, I sort of had to stumble across it and figure it out on my own. And so when I look back at, at, at my experience in training and uh, you know, it was 10 years of medical education, uh, uh, four years of medical school, another four years of residency, and then another two as a subspecialist. In all of those years of training, uh, none of my mentors, professors, or educators ever connected those two dots. And again, my doctors who were the best uh, top leading experts in MS were incapable of giving me this all important life-saving advice. And so my mission has been not only to share uh, my work with my patients and hopefully serve those who um, I have the honor and privilege of caring for, but also um, influencing uh, future generations of physicians and hope, hopefully uh, creating change in the curricula of all medical schools, all professional healthcare professional schools that for whatever reason continue to uh, miss this opportunity. I had shared this, a little bit about this when I spoke to Kathy earlier this week, but in medical school, the way we train is under this umbrella of pathogenesis. What we learn and we become expert in is uh, understanding the root of disease and illness. So I always tell my medical students, what we learn is how to become really good disease detectives, right? We learn how to take a thorough history and physical examination. We're collecting clues. We order labs and imaging studies, again, collecting clues. Ultimately, we take all of this information and we make a diagnosis. And once we have that diagnosis, we create a treatment plan. And the way that we are trained is that treatment plan includes a pharmaceutical agent, a procedure, or a surgical intervention, sometimes all of them. What 
and of course, all of that is important. It's an important part of our training as medical professionals. But what is missing in that experience is that we don't learn anything about the other end of the, of the human health continuum. What we learn is this idea of pathogenesis. What we don't learn is salutogenesis, which is the mirror image of pathogenesis, which is how, the study of health and well-being. How do we maintain health and well-being? And of course, if you were to envision what that would look like in a curricula in medical school, it would mean covering uh, nutrition, um, the importance of physical activity and its role on health maintenance, stress management, sleep, um, the importance of addressing substance abuse issues, which are incredibly prevalent in our country, and also the importance of mental health, uh, uh, social interconnectedness, and its role in, in, in health and well-being. All of that is missed in our experience in medical school, and it leaves us, it produces physicians that are, only, um, that are ill-equipped to manage the chronic disease epidemic in which we live today. Uh, and I think that uh, we have work to do. And this was largely what fueled uh, the, the making of the film, Code Blue, because obviously the dream of the documentarian is to shed light on a lapse in society or in culture in hopes that um, bringing attention to it will, will conjure up interest in the masses so that we can bring voice to it and, and make change. And um, and that's what my hope is, that the film will resonate uh, with the general public and with those in, in the field of medicine, so that uh, particularly the academic uh, wing in medicine that creates curricula uh, at these schools, so that we can prepare these young men and women who want to dedicate their life to caring for the public, that they have this foundation of what we call salutogenesis or uh, lifestyle medicine, uh, so that they too can um, practice medicine while knowing, of course, all the wonderful aspects and, uh, and advances that we've achieved in the past uh, several decades. Of course, all of those things are, are important. All the um, uh, surgical interventions and, and pharmaceutical agents we have available to us, but that we practice in, in uh, an environment where salutogenesis, prevention is primary. Uh, prevention is valued greatly, and, and that's not where we are today. We need to place uh, great emphasis on prevention because we can, uh, we can prevent, obviously, uh, so much pain and suffering. I'll give you an example. We're, it's October. We're just about to end October, but October is, is recognized as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we do so much to bring attention to this all-important uh, disease process, and we wear pink, and and even in the NFL, uh, they'll play, they'll wear pink, and it's wonderful to bring so much attention to this topic because uh, it, it is important. Uh, but here's what what happens in in this period when we bring attention to breast cancer awareness. It's about early detection. It's about uh, ensuring um, that we get the word out. The mammography is an important part of that um, uh, early detection. And, and of course, all of that is important, but the truth is, if you look at the evidence in the literature, we know that by modifying our behaviors, by consuming a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and by engaging in physical activity, by avoiding excess alcohol, by not smoking, that we could, and this doesn't come from me, this comes from Graham Kalditz, who's one of the leading researchers in breast cancer, he tells us and, uh, that we could potentially prevent 50% of breast cancer. And I think that's extraordinary and it's not spoken to. Uh, and it's, it's regrettable that during this entire month, no one really talks about the importance of prevention in breast cancer. So it is my hope that the film and the book that I've written, and actually Robert, the, the book is not yet out. It comes out on January 12th. It was, the book release was pushed out a little bit because of COVID. Uh, this pandemic has affected us in so many ways. Uh, so the book will be released on January 12th. So I'm really looking forward to it. And the book is simply uh, just an honest and um, very straightforward conversation between myself and the reader. And as if you were in my office and we were having a conversation and just speaking to all aspects of lifestyle. So lifestyle medicine, yes, importantly includes uh, diet and, and nutrition but it also addresses other aspects of, of lifestyle that are incredi incredibly important, like 
uh, exercise and stress management and, and sleep, substance abuse and social interconnectedness. So I like to talk or speak to them as the spokes on the lifestyle medicine wheel that um, if, we, if you can envision a wheel with six spokes and uh, it's important for us to address all of them, right? So if we're really good at just diet and exercise, but then we drink too much and we don't sleep or we're super stressed because we're working too hard and not taking care of ourselves, then those other spokes on that wheel are sort of gonna be weakened and, and you're gonna have a wonky ride moving forward. So I, the point of all of that is that I want all of us to, to speak to and pay attention to all aspects of lifestyle because I think when we do that, um, we have, we, it's what I call the sweet spot and, and we're going to optimize um, uh, our, our personal health and, and hopefully avoid uh, chronic diseases. And I just want to say one other thing because I am an infectious disease physician and we are living in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and I can tell you that, and even talking to my mentors who um, in the field of infectious diseases, this period has really sort of uh, been uh, just taking our breath away. I, I don't think we could have ever envisioned uh, where we are today. Um, but, I, but I want to sort of bring together this idea of this pandemic and, and the chronic disease epidemic because these two worlds really have in, in, in large way, in a large way um, come together. What we've learned that with this pandemic is that those who are most deeply affected are, are individuals that are living with a chronic disease, namely heart disease, diabetes, uh, chronic lung disease like COPD, obesity. And what we've learned in, in the data is that if you have a chronic disease, you're six times more likely to be hospitalized and 12 times more likely to die. So this chronic disease epidemic that may be in our America, in the American um, thought process doesn't really seem like an acute issue is something that we might think might be a problem, you know, when we're 20 or 30, we engage in behaviors that aren't exactly the best for us. And we don't really think of, about it because it's long term. Um, COVID has brought these issues to become very acute. And it is my hope that the silver lining of this period uh, is that uh, that it'll bring attention to the importance of the chronic disease epidemic in which we live today. And I hope it stirs interest um, to bring change, meaningful change to our uh, daily behavior so that um, in fact, uh, long-term some good will come of all of this because it is un undoubted, un you know, undeniable rather that we are a community in this country that is ill-equipped uh, to battle this acute infectious disease in light of the fact that we are uh, living in the midst of a chronic disease uh, epidemic. And uh, even just speaking to the obesity matter, um, we know that two thirds or 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. And, and it is, this is a problem that I just wanna make this point is not something that um, seems to have plateaued. It, it, it's always surprising to me how every year uh, seemingly we worsen. Just to give you an example of that, when I began writing the book 18 months ago, so in I guess in 2019, the summer of 2019, I wrote the section on obesity for the book initially. And at the time, the rates of obesity reported by the CDC uh, were 39.8% of Americans uh, met the definition of obesity, which is a BMI greater than 30. And then in the past couple of uh, months, uh, in final review and, and checking facts and assuring that everything in the in the book um, that uh, you know is scientifically sound, uh, I reviewed the the obesity rates and again went to, back to the CDC to double check. And what I found was that the obesity rate this summer in 2020 had gone from 39.8 to 42.4 percent, which which is Amazing, in one year, our obesity rates climbed by more than 2%. Again, sort of reflecting how much we're sort of in the thick of this, that, that this idea of disease rates and, and obesity rates sort of plateauing is not the case. I mean, another example is diabetes. Uh, when I was in medical school 25 plus years ago, rates of diabetes in this country about 2%, 2.5%. 
Today, we're brushing past 10%, and the CDC ominously predicts that by 2050, we'll be at more than 30% of Americans living with diabetes. So clearly, there's something that we're doing in medicine that is missing the mark, or the name of the, the title of my book is What's Missing from Medicine. And I think what is missing from medicine is this whole aspect or that I've, I've just spoken to this idea that uh, lifestyle and salutogenesis or the, this, prevent, this idea of prevention um, become uh, important and, and primary and, and all physicians and healthcare professionals should be speaking to it. Um, Dr. Stancic, that brings up a question that's been asked, you know, what, how would you suggest we approach doctors, our doctor who doesn't obviously hasn't had the training and hasn't been able to go and document and read the documents like you have. How do we, how do we approach them? Right. Well, I think, I think you can have that conversation um, with your physician and let him know, give him references like Esselstyn's book or China study. There's a lot of really wonderful books uh, by uh, extraordinary authors that you might want to share with them. I know there's, there are patients who do that. They'll drop off a book to their physician. Um, you can share code blue with your physician. Uh, you can have conversations, share with them the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, you know, write it down on a, on a little piece of paper and leave it at their at their side. Maybe they'll check on it later. So it's it's about planting seeds. It's about um, helping and even sharing literature with them. That's something that I think uh, is very important because that's what speaks to conventional medicine. They want to see the evidence. So it's giving them a copy of uh, the Potsdam study, which is a wonderful publication uh, that clearly speaks to the importance of prevention and its role in, in um, reducing uh, chronic disease. I think putting the word out and, and explaining to the physician, this is important to me, uh, I, that uh, prevention approaches are of value to me and true prevention, not secondary prevention, because I, I think a lot of my colleagues refer to prevention as mammography or you know prostate exam or PSAs, that's secondary prevention or what we call early detection. Primary prevention is preventing the disease altogether. And those um, approaches are embedded in, in lifestyle, right? So diet, exercise, stress, all the aspects uh, of lifestyle. But I think the good news is, Kathy, that this, gen this generation, the uh, millennial generation, I can tell you my medical students, and I, as I've traveled across the country, we've done many screenings at many medical schools, and I've had the great opportunity of talking to young uh, physicians. They get this, and they're bringing it to the forefront, and they're in introducing it into their practice. So I think the future is, is bright, and, and I think there's a lot of positive uh, shift. Maybe some physicians in my generation who are sort of stuck in their way and didn't get any of this are, are, are slow to receive this message. But I can also tell you that the American College of Lifestyle Medicine Conference every year is growing. I think the first time I went, there might have been 100 physicians in the room. And the last meeting that we had in Florida last year, we had um, at least 2,500 physicians in, in pre uh, present at that conference. And we screened Code Blue in that audience, which was a, one of the biggest um, moments in my life to, to ex experience that. Yeah, I think Linda, um, and we're hearing from several that they, they've had the problem of, you know, how to approach your doctor. So those were good ideas. And Dillip suggested um, PCRM, too, might be something. Now, there's one thing that I was curious, because we do have some people here that I know of that may have relatives that have MS. Where, uh, where should they go for more information? Like, do they wait for your book to be published to kind of get some uh, like when you talked about the lifestyle things, you know, how do you attack sleep? What do you do about that? You know, those kinds of things. And we know about diet because we're working with that here in Chat and Chew, but some of those other anchors. Right. Well, well, sure. I, I would, I would love um, uh, everyone to um, uh, be interested in, in my book where I do discuss all of these topics, but there's a lot of it. And, and by the way, um, Everything that we talk about, and the way I would re um, counsel an MS patient would be no different than the way I would counsel a diabetic, in that all of these lifestyle parameters are important in, in, in managing any chronic disease. Uh, there's a wonderful website called Overcoming MS. Um, 
It is uh, founded by my friend and colleague, George Jelinek, who is a, I believe he is in um, uh, Australia, uh, Australia is, is I, I believe, or New Zealand, I'm sorry, New Zealand. Okay. He is also a physician with multiple sclerosis and he's written uh, several books and, um, and he has a wonderful website with many resources that I think are beneficial uh, for MS patients. So I would definitely recommend that. But I think um, for, for MS, the same principles that we apply to heart disease and diabetes, it's, well, th that's the wonderful thing about lifestyle medicine. The prescription doesn't change. Uh, all the, because at the end of it, chronic disease, the root of chronic disease is inflammation. And it's expressed differently in patients depending on their genetic predisposition. So certainly uh, my genetic predisposition to autoimmune disease uh, and, and led to the expression of multiple sclerosis. But I, I, I just want to make that point that the principles that we're talking about here, optimizing all aspects of lifestyle, are beneficial regardless of what chronic disease you've been diagnosed with and are beneficial regardless of whether or not you've been diagnosed with anything. So even if, you've, if you're feeling great and you're, and you're healthy and you're young, I would want you to adopt these principles simply because we want to act in a preventive nature. And, 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 and I said this the other day, but I'll say it again. I want all of us to age gracefully uh, and joyfully. And, and I want to, to prevent that bookend of suffering that I've witnessed for so many years practicing medicine over 25 years. The typical end to life is that two to three year bookend living in a nursing home uh, demented um, with pressure ulcers and and you know Foley catheters. I mean, this is what I experienced as a physician in consultative practice, and we have the knowledge and understanding to prevent that. And for my hope for all of us is to you know at age ninety eight, after spending a beautiful, wonderful day with our loved ones, sharing a beautiful, bright, whole food, plant based meal, that at the end of that day, we go to bed fall asleep peacefully and don't wake up. I mean, that's the beautiful ending to uh, a that's life well plan. lived. And, and that's what um, I think we, we can do that. We can largely do that, but it's important that we deliver this message to as many as possible so that um, we can empower individuals to, to take control of their personal health. Yeah. Um, we, one of the things in your movie just ties in perfectly with what Chat and Chew is going to do next. And um, I'm just going to throw it up on the screen real quick. Um, this was uh, our plans and we talked about this. Let's see if I can get it to go up. Okay. Current slide. Yeah, there we go. Um, that is what's happening. Whoops. <laughs> Dr. Puska. Yes. And you have him in your film. And what was it about what he did in Finland that we are going to find out about in November on the 13th? Oh, it's just a remarkable story what happened in North Karelia where they had the highest rates of heart disease in the world in the 1960s. And um, this was an extraordinary undertaking where um, they utilized community, which I love, um, to create a meaningful change. And uh, Dr. Puska, um, was able to, and, and his entire team, this is the North Karelia project, and, and then extended out to the entire country of Finland um, to uh, create such meaningful change. And, and, and this speaks to the importance of, of education and personal empowerment and helping individuals to understand the connections between smoking and saturated fat and heart disease. And, and it was simply employing, you know, housewives and um, uh, just anybody, you know, nurses, students, uh, employing individuals to uh, educate and disseminate messages in libraries, in, in all kinds of institutions. And, and they did this so effectively by creating this network of empower, empowerment across the country. They were able to deliver these messages and even make uh, small changes uh, in, in, in their dietary, uh, in, the, in their, the, the, the menu of, of dietary options, even small changes led to significant improvement and outcomes. So yes, we talk about um, the accomplishments, uh, which were extraordinary, uh, an 82% reduction in coronary artery disease uh, within a 25-year period, uh, which is just... Um, 
I think extraordinary and something that we could we could use the examples from that North Karelia project and apply them to our own uh, needs here in this country where we are uh, in quite a bit of trouble. As I said, the obesity rate and the diabetes rate climbing near exponentially. And we have, I think Dr. Puska's example offers us um, hope that certainly th this idea of, of um, disseminating education effectively can certainly um, make a big difference. I think a lot of my colleagues say this to me, and and I hopefully I I mean I think I've done enough to prove them wrong, and hopefully some will come to to understand that it's not true. I think the average physician largely feels that people aren't aren't going to change, that they're just not going to give up their cheeseburgers, that they're just not going to get up and exercise, they're just not going to do that. They just don't, and that's not true. I think that um, most people want to feel better. Most people want to. Um, have lives free of, of disease and, and, and they don't want to be dependent on scores of medication and they just don't know how to get there. And they need physicians who are going to give them the tools and put them on the path and support them on, on change. There are a lot of uh, uh, difficulties before us. Our, our culture and society doesn't, doesn't support it. Um, we have fast food restaurants on almost feels like almost every street corner and large cities across our country uh, and and some cities are lack access to fresh fruits and vegetables we call those food deserts so we have a lot of work to do um, but i think there's there are a lot of people who are interested in in creating uh this change and understand that um much can be accomplished again the north karelia project is an extraordinary example of what we can do when we put our minds together and, and we coalesce uh, to achieve an, um, an important mission. We so need to have a Winter Haven project. <laughs> yes, yes. Have a yes. Winter Haven project. The Winter Haven, that's where you are in Florida, yes? Right, right. Yes. <laughs> or you could call it the Winter Haven project, yes. Like <laughs> well, we will get our first start with our Zoom with Dr. Puska next November the 13th. Friday the 13th is a good thing. Oh my goodness. I want to definitely call into that. I, it would be an honor to, to um, because I've never met him before and I'd, I'd love to, to uh, hear what he has to say. Well, we'll send you a link to our Eventbrite and everybody else, Eventbrite has it up at one o'clock today so you can register too. I will. Um, one thing as we close out, um, because I know 1230 is when you needed to leave us. And so um, I just wanted to let, would, um, Laura Goolsby, would you unmute yourself? I want to just tell you about Laura. She is in charge of the master's program for nutrition at Kaiser. And um, she's a lot of things, but that's one thing I know her from. And Laura, tell her your message after you watch Code Blue. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and for sharing this video with us. And I, I just had such an emotional reaction to it um, because the problem is so big. Um, and you know, in my little way, I tried to, you know, we have our Meatless Monday project that we require our interns to do. And we, you know, try to share the evidence-based information. But I was also struck by all of the prongs that are needed. You know, some of, I follow Dr. Chatterjee also, who um, also includes a lot of what you're saying in terms of stress reduction, exercise, everything. And, um, and a plant-based diet. But I, I feel like, um, you know, your message to medical schools and to dietic dietetics education also, because we do have, we are subsidized by, um, you know, our, our association, for example, is subsidized by the Dairy Council, by the Beef Council, et cetera. And it's such a huge problem um, to overcome all of that. I, I do think that, um, and what I wrote in the comment is that we also need to encourage in our public schools to teach all of these prongs to health. And, to, and when I was talking to my son about it, who's 30 and is a culinary professional, um, that's what he said. He said, you know, mom, we need to, it needs to be normalized from elementary school up that how to choose healthy foods, how to cook them, gardening in schools. And some of that's being done. Um, but we need to do so much more. And I'm, I'm humbled and overwhelmed by the prospect, but we need to do a little bit every day. 
I, I agree wholeheartedly and th thank you for sharing that. And actually, you know, the, this d didn't make it into Code Blue, but we did shoot with uh, a young man in, in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, who, uh, who had reached out to me several years ago when he was an eighth grader. We filmed with him when he was already in high school, but he was a young man who, who brought attention to uh, an absence of plant-based options in, in the Boston school system. And he actually um, uh, approached the legislation uh, in legislative body in, in Massachusetts. And he was able to, I wrote a letter uh, so supporting um, his request uh, to bring uh, change. And he, he was able to get something through the legislation that now has, he's now in college has now led to um, plant-based options being presented uh, to all children in Massachusetts. And it's young people like that, that, that just inspire me. Uh, and I, and there's great potential. And I, and I realize it's, it's a huge, it's a lot of work that we have to do, but how wonderful when we come together as, uh, as an organization uh, and help one another, we, there's so much we can do. So find other inspirational, passionate people in your zip code and meet and, and brainstorm and find ways to, to create change. And I think that um, there's a lot of potential. Right. Laura, I, I wanted to chime in on that as well. And I mentioned this in chat is mm -hmm. that I've started, I'm, I'm a nutrition education director for an elementary school and, we, and I put together a program called the Healthy Snack Program. I reach K through five and indirectly I teach six, I, I reach six through eight. Mm -hmm. And it's something anybody can do. So if you have an interest, definitely contact me offline. It doesn't take a lot of money and it has such a huge impact. So the program I've designed, we, we actually get Instant Pots in the hands of, uh, of teachers. And I, I have oh, access to the awesome. classroom and I give talks on plant-based eating. And, and, and I've come up with a way to do it so it's not at all, um, uh, it doesn't challenge the parents. It's positive information and I don't push back on parents' mm -hmm. own views. But then the, the classroom teacher at least two or three times a week is preparing lentils and soup or mm -hmm. Uh, vegan yogurt is all plant-based. It's almost all whole food plant-based. It's all vegan for sure. And uh, students who may otherwise say, I don't like beans, I don't like kale, they all love the food and it, it really doesn't cost much money. So uh, there are things that we can do. And if you are connected to a local school system, I know Debbie, you've been um, uh, connected. Um, then uh, these are things that you can do very directly. I think that having people actually eat the food, taste the food and see how easy it is. Um, the other thing in schools is we need to look at the subsidized foods like the school lunch program. And that's a tough battle to fight, but um, cow's milk is heavily subsidized. Mm -hmm. the school where I'm the nutrition education director, soy milk when I came aboard wasn't available. And the excuse was that it's too expensive. So I arranged for some funding so that the price is the same. So if a child wants soy milk, it, it should really be cheaper. Now it's the same price. So there's lots of things like that that can be done. And I'm very happy to help you decide if you decide you want to go that route. Great. Thank you, Dilip. We appreciate that. And, and Dr. Stancic, we want to honor your time. And so we just want you to know how much we appreciate you talking with us. And we're going to stay on everybody afterwards because Dilip has a couple of things that he can help us with too. But thank you so much. We really wish you well on finishing that book because we want one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. Okay. You too. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dr. Stancic. Um, Dilip, you had written um, about that um, website too. Um, if Vicki or maybe Dilip knows, if if people save the chat, will it go to their um, uh, email address so they can get that one? Or that was the one if you had uh, MS. Um, um, I'm not sure. I know I have it automatically saved. That's how I've got my account set up. I don't know if individuals can save it or not. It's not. Uh, okay, overcomingms.org is the one that she talked about if you're interested for, and it has a backward slash. So it's https colon backward slash backward slash overcomingms dot org backward slash. I'll put it in our um, show more section when we I was I was thinking too you can probably I will email you my chat where I've okay. saved it and then you can include whatever parts of it you want to in okay. the next newsletter or with people that want it. 
And we can put that in from contact information about Dillard too. Would that be okay with you, Dillard? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy. If anybody has groups, I know we have at least one person from um, from Australia, for example. We have shown Code Blue in Australia. Actually, Neil Neil Barnard uh, introduced it, so we've shown it around the world. But we're very happy to help facilitate more screenings. So anybody who has connections, who wants to have the uh, film shown, just contact me. And we'll have we'll be happy to help you make that happen. Right. Um, and Claudia's here, and I'm assuming Claudia, you're from England. Um, can you unmute yourself and tell us your experience? Because it's a little different when you're out of the country and you watch Code Blue. And James was very helpful. Um, are you still here, Claudia? Yes, I just went to go get uh, a nice tall glass of water that I drink every day now. I have uh, filtered water because um, uh, it's the best if you want to lose weight. Um, and I'm so actually well, going to tell bigger. us about what Jane, what happened when you tried to register. Okay, James, it, 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 I just got an email from him at 12:30 a.m. because it's 2 2:40 uh, a.m. here in Queensland, Australia. Oh, you're in um, Australia. <laughs> yep. And remember, Kathy, I said I'm going to invite you one day, you and Rob. <laughs> what about but me? Anyway, that's, <laughs> you better not say that out loud in this group because we're kind of all family. But what did James do for you? Because your challenge was... Well, what he said, well I had a lot of problems and um, because I'm in Australia, no matter which, which box I ticked, if it was the rent or buy or gift, it all popped up the same, put my email address, confirm my email address, and then it wanted the uh, credit card details and then... Uh, it's a complete purchase. So it, it didn't have the redeem. So this morning he sent uh, uh, the movie via, via, uh, via, via, and, uh, so via. Just, via, and I just managed to watch only uh, 15 minutes, but I'm going to watch it later. Good, but, good. And I'm sorry about those technical problems that here and there we're, we're having a few technical problems. So if you do have any such issues, contact us, our distributor will get you. We'll get yeah. you fixed up. That, no, that was lovely. He he helped me out, and I'm just real, I'm delighted. I'm ecstatic. I'm really happy that I'll be able to watch. It, it looks really. It looks excellent. So I'm, I'm, I got my tissue box next to me too. <laughs> we we we'll, we'll feel very lucky. The distributor we're working with actually is the same distributor. You're all I'm, I'm sure familiar with Forks Over Knives, which is mm -hmm. another classic film, uh, and so um, we hope to be a classic film as well. But uh, we picked uh, this distributor because they distributed Forks Over Knives. Yeah, I belong to a few groups, so I will be able to share that, but uh, I, I sent you a little uh, post there to you. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, My pleasure. One other thing that I was thinking about is, Dilip, you also made note of if you're looking for a plant-based doctor, would you explain that for us? Yeah, so I shared in the chat, there's a couple of sites. One is, I think, plantbaseddocs.com, and it's in the chat. And so if you have a doctor who is plant-based, um, I live in North Carolina. So in my area, we have a, a number of doctors who are plant-based. One doctor does, um, what's it called? Um, um, what's it called when you pay a set fee and it's concierge medicine. Uh -huh. And so if you join his practice, his name is Dr. George Jacobs. If you join his practice, then he asks you to take a book either by Neil Barnard, Barnard or uh, Caldwell Esselstyn. He has like three or four books. And then he bases his practice on whole food plant-based eating. So uh, plant-based docs lists, uh, you can search there. You can say, hey, I live in uh, Lakeland, Florida or Orlando, Florida, wherever you live. And you can see what uh, plant-based practitioners are near you. And by the same token, a couple of you had chatted with me. Um, if you know practitioners in your area, they can enroll in the website so people can find them in turn. Uh, but um, one thing I said in chat is ultimately our health obviously is, you know, our own personal responsibility. And there are doctors who have, there's a spectrum of doctors from those who focus tremendously on prevention to those who really are just focused on, somebody had said, talked about stents and, you know, the end goal. We, we, need, uh, we need medicine like stents and we need, uh, uh, you know, extreme cases, but we also, I think more so than that, need prevention. And I think it's important for us to find those doctors who are promoting prevention. One thing which drives a lot of this is really the AMA. I don't know if we have any physicians on the call, the American Medical Association. The Medi Medi American Medical Association rewards uh, and insurance rewards for procedures. 
And so I have a good friend, he's the head of his hospital. He's a vegan cardiologist, uh, but his bread and butter is putting stents in. So he tries to educate people about, don't come to me, but eat well and, and you know, be healthy. But it's against his financial self-interest. He still does it because it's the right thing to do. But many people wouldn't do that. So um, we need to change one thing which really surprises me, this is an election time, right? We're voting next week, or many of us probably have already voted. And all sides, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, they all get it wrong in terms of health care. They, they talk about health care being a crisis, and it really is a crisis. But nobody's offering solutions. They're talking about, you know, on one side having more privatized health care, and the other side having more public health care, and, and it elic elicits strong reactions both ways. And there are arguments to be made on, on both sides of that. But even more importantly than that is why don't we get ourselves so that we don't need that kind of health care? Why don't we eat well? Why don't we practice lifestyle medicine? It turns out it costs a fraction of, you know, if you let these things bubble to becoming, um, you know, big health issues, it costs a lot of money. It causes a lot of pain. It taxes the health care system. So I wish Republicans, I wish Democrats, I wish independents talked about moving towards plant-based eating. At minimum, the government should stop advocating things that are bad for us. They should stop advocating cow's milk. They should stop promoting uh, the meat and dairy industries. That's at minimum. And at best, they should say, guess what? Uh, if you look at the studies, as you decrease your milk consumption, your bone fracture rate goes down. So we encourage, you know, this isn't a dictatorship, right? We can't tell you what to do, but we encourage you to eat well and going plant-based would help you. So. I encourage all of you from in the political sphere, whatever your ideology is to, you know, please, and whether you're in Australia or the United States or wherever, please try to get your representatives to be aware of these issues. I have a, um, a call in with our local mayor and I'm supposed to meet with him at some point and talk about how we can help address COVID-19. We can't promise that you won't get COVID-19 if you go vegan, but it turns out something like 94% of fatalities from COVID-19 have happened with people with comorbidities like diabetes, colorectal cancer, uh, heart disease, and plant-based diet can forestall a lot of these things. So though we can't promise you won't get COVID-19, if you are plant-based, there's a reasonable chance you won't get the worst outcomes. I think it would help if we called it what it is, because we do not have health care in this country. We have disease okay. management. Care. And so if they were to call it disease management, people would have a different thought about it. It's not healthcare. Healthcare is what we do. We take care of our health. Our healthcare industry is actually just disease management. That's all. And we should call it that. That's a great way of describing it. I haven't thought of that as disease management. That's, that's a clever way of describing it. <laughs> yes. Um, so what, what we're going to be looking at then next month is what we can do as a community. And that's what Dr. Pushka could, could bring to us. So all that you said with us today, Dilip, will really be helpful in what we've learned from Dr. Stansik and from the movie. And just to everybody, if you haven't watched the movie, it's okay, Dilip, if we watch it this next week or so, right? So our, our, our um, free pass link is still good and our promo code. So I, I, Kathy, we've I, had some people message that they they didn't get the link or they don't think they got the link. Does that did come in an email from Eventbrite? Is that correct? So the link came um, early on, early in the week, and <laughs> no, two weeks ago it started going, and it came from Eventbrite, but it was from the Gmail five four three two one health link um, email. So um, if you didn't get the link or you can't find the email or you don't, it might, your email might have gone to spam, send me an email at 54321health at gmail.com, our regular, and I'll put that in, in Zoom, because, I mean, in the chat, because evidently everybody can save the chat. So if you have a problem, you can send it to me and then I'll just double check the list and give you, because um, I'm pretty sure we did everybody, but you know, mm -hmm. there's ways that that could, and, and Kathy, can I toss something out there? I, I believe it's the case that once you open it, you have, I think, 24 hours to see it. So, for example, if you start watching and say, this is great, but I, I need some more time. I want to wait for my grandchild or my son or my mom to come visit, and they're coming day after tomorrow, it may time out. So be aware of that. I think you have 24 hours from when you begin watching it. 
Yeah, there was a limited time after. At one point, I heard three days, but whatever. You know, when you register, be ready to watch it. I think we mentioned that in the email. And I've, I've put in the chat our email address, so that's what you would send me an email. I'm Kathy, and that way we can be sure you've gotten it. So we, we just want to say to you, Dilip, how much we appreciate what you've done for us. 